Bueno, buenos días. ¿Se escucha? Buenos días a todos. Vamos a iniciar la sesión de hoy con nuestro keynote speaker, Igor Giangrossi, a quien le pedimos que suba. Igor eh, tiene el título de Ingeniería Eléctrica del Instituto Magua de Tecnología en Brasil y es alumno del Harvard Business School del Programa para el Desarrollo de Liderazgo. Es director senior de Consulting Engineering en Nokia, donde dirige un equipo que trabaja en la planificación y diseño de 5G para operadores en América del Norte, en las áreas de redes IP y Mobile Packet Core. Con más de 20 años de experiencia en la industria de redes, él cree que la tecnología es solo un medio para un fin y que lo más simple definitivamente es mejor. Bueno, lo recibimos con un aplauso. Hello. Yeah. yeah, good morning, everyone. I apologize in advance. I speak Portuguese and Spanish, but if I try to do this in Portuguese or Spanish, I, I don't think we're going to finish in time here. So uh, just to, you know, and respect to the other present, presenters, uh, I'll do this in English. But uh, by all means, feel free to ask in Portuguese or Spanish any questions, and I'll be able to, to answer that as well. So. Um, uh, Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be back after so many years uh, at LACNOG. And uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that is, uh, has been, uh, there's been a lot of hype in, in the industry and in the press, which is 5G. And most of the time when we hear about 5G, we either hear that from a radio perspective, so what are the radio technologies, uh, how the new radio uh, will, will uh, give us a lot more bandwidth and different services, or uh, we hear that from a, from a marketing perspective where you say, you know, 5G will save the world. So it can do everything and uh, be all um, kind of the last technology we'll ever see. So I, I want to bring 5G from a different perspective, and that's the perspective of a uh, IP engineer, which I think uh, everybody or most of us here in the room are. Um, so. When we begin uh, going through that, I think it's important to contextualize what 5G is, because we have all been using 4G and, and you know, 3G and, and 2G as well, but what is really 5G? So this is a graph, or a pair of graphs, actually, that um, was built by uh, ITU. And ITU is, is the standards body that uh, creates uh, the concepts around what is going to be the next generation or the next Gs. So it all begins with ITU defining all of those uh, requirements for the technology, and then 3GPP actually goes and, and standardizes those technologies, create, create the technology and standardizes that. Uh, and this is how ITU puts the objectives for 5G. So you can see on the left a graph comparing in gray uh, for the 4G characteristics and in, um, and in blue, the 5G characteristics, and you see, you know, 5G is better in everything, <laughs> essentially. But uh, there's a few important uh, points here in this graph, which are, uh, for example, peak data rate. So we are aiming for a potentially multiple of 20 uh, of comparing um, 4G to 5G, uh, and a potentially multiple of 10 when compared uh, the uh, average data rates for the average user. So that's going to be a large bump on speeds, and uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, outcomes of that bump in speed is that we can actually start thinking about using 5G for fixed broadband for homes instead of just for cell phones. So that is a, a new business case that uh, we'll definitely see with 5G. Uh, the other important factor here is latency, uh, and we get around maybe 10, 20 milliseconds for 4G in terms of latency. And the aim here is to go all the way up to one millisecond potentially. And um, I'll, I'll give some more details on how that's achieved as well. And uh, I won't go through all of it, but you can see all of the different characteristics there in the left graph. And then the biggest question is, what do we do with that, right? So we put a technology up and say, well, uh, I can provide all of these characteristics, but uh, what use cases are going to take advantage of that technology? And that's also being standardized by ITU. So you see your graph in the right, where it shows three main 
use cases, which are enhanced mobile broadband, so that's what it says, uh, just better mobile broadband. Uh, and then in, in blue, you can see all of the characteristics that take advantage, uh, that uh, EMBB, as, uh, as the acronym implies, uh, takes advantage of that. Then there's also a big focus on IoT, and you see that with the uh, massive machine type communications, so that's essentially IoT and making IoT more scalable and uh, connecting a lot more devices there uh, in light gray. And in kind of darker gray, you see uh, ultra-reliable and low latency. So that's yet another focus of 5G, which is to provide very low latency communications for any type of use case that can take advantage of it. And uh, what's interesting is that you see all of these three uh, use cases reflected across all of the 3GPP standards. Uh, and even in a protocol, so I'm not going into those types of details, but uh, that's how 3GPP started as a uh, set of requirements, and that's uh, how uh, the use cases that uh, 3GPP put together to uh, create a technology to address these. Um, so then it's interesting to look at the kind of an anatomy of any mobile technology, and I put the 5G uh, um, picture here and uh, we can contextualize this with uh, some different areas in the network. So in the far left, uh, you see the radios. Uh, and, and there's a whole lot of radios. That's the cell towers that you see everywhere and that give us coverage for the service. Uh, then in the middle with uh, some uh, black, um, black icons here, you see what we call the, the core of the network. And, and that's the mobility core, not necessarily an IP core as we know it. So that's where we have all the systems for user plane and control plane, for authentication, for charging, for policy, uh, all of the, the things that uh, make um, the mobile networks deliver the services. Uh, and we uh, refer to them as a, uh, generically as a core. And we see three elements in the core. I'll talk about them very briefly. And in between those uh, uh, radios and the core, we have a network which is typically called backhaul network. So that is a massive network. It's an IP network that connects every single radio back to these core locations. So uh, in you know, any large country or small country, you need to deliver connectivity to every single radio site. And then um, that's the main focus of the presentation that we're gonna go through here. Uh, and I'll just mention uh, the other IP network that you see uh, mentioned as IP core in the right of the diagram. That's just an IP network as we know it. Could be a local internet offload point, could be a national backbone, could be anything. It's just a plain, normal IP routed network, right? So looking at the protocols that this network uh, uses, and, and uh, before going into the protoc protocols, I actually just mentioned that whenever we build a network, any of us here, um, the first thing we need to look at is uh, who's going to be the customer for this network or what is the application that uh, we want to deliver across this network. And, and that is what will ultimately drive all of the requirements and how we build that network. And in this case, the customer is the radio. So we're building a network that will serve the radio. So we need to understand what are the requirements that come from the radio side and translate that into IP design tenets or design principles so that we can deliver that service. Um, and then uh, the first thing that we need to look at, okay, it's an IP network, right, but uh, what protocols do we use? So um, not everyone is completely familiar with uh, mobility, so I thought I would just put some protocol stacks here. So there's some two main flows, types of flows here in this network, which are control plane and user plane. There's also management, there's also synchronization, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, but from a control plane perspective, uh, the mobility control plane, the radio control plane uses SCTP protocol. So it's, uh, it runs over IP. Uh, it, it has some interesting uh, capabilities uh, when compared to standard TCP, such as uh, multi-streams and things like that. But it's just an IP flow. Uh, and the same thing goes for the user plane. It's also an IP flow. It's, uh, it uses UDP uh, encapsulation with uh, uh, GTPU uh, as the upper protocol. And, and the reason we do encapsulation in this part of the network is, is basically uh, to avoid exposing the IP packets of the users so that we can provide mobility. 
right? So uh, this is uh, one of the key fundamental ways for us to provide mobility so that if you move from one radio to the other, uh, you're not changing your IP address, but rather you're changing the outer IP address of the tunnel between the radio and the core, right? So that's uh, one of the key reasons we do that. There, there are others, but this is the main one. And then we have a few elements in the core there. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details, but AMF does mobility management uh, and uh, help, uh, helps doing authentication. And then we have SMF and UPF. SMF does uh, session management. It's called session management function. Session is anything that you uh, need to set up a flow through the network. So if you want to access um, you know, any website, you need to set up a flow there, and uh, the SMF does that. And the UPF is the user plane function, so it's really a forwarder. And the UPF and the SMF, they work pretty much in, in a way, you could think about it as an SDN-like uh, architecture where the SMF will send flows uh, to the UPF and will say, well, when this type of flow uh, gets here, you uh, will report usage, you will implement maybe DPI uh, charge for this specific uh, uh, content in this specific way and so on and so forth, right? So. Uh, that's how it, it's done, and, and the protocol between those is uh, based on PFCP, so it's uh, called Packet Forwarding uh, Control Protocol. It's derived from another protocol in 3GPP, which is uh, GTPC, and again, I'm talking about lots of acronyms here. I, I won't go through that in a lot more detail, but it's just for you guys to, to understand that there's a lot of uh, things that are not commonly seen in standard IP internet routed networks, so there's a very specific type of protocols and, and ways of building this in a mobile network that are, that are not common to any other type of application. Okay, so the first thing that we hear about 5G or one of the first things that we might hear is network slicing. And um, uh, we as network engineers have been doing network slicing forever in our lives, right? We've done VLANs, we've done VRFs. Uh, and you can name many other, uh, you know, uh, subdivision or uh, uh, domain control type of technology or isolation technologies in, in IP and even Ethernet networking. And the thing about network slicing, the, the main uh, factor here is that for the first time, the standards uh, were created in such a way that you now can slice every single element of this network from an end-to-end -end perspective. So meaning the radio, and uh, the radio is called G node being 5G, the radio is going to be slice aware. So um, uh, if you want to create, call it a VLAN or call it a VRF, so it's going to be aware of that. Uh, all of the transport networks need to, needs to be aware of that as well. And all of the core elements needs to be, uh, uh, um, need to be aware of that as well. And you might have different core elements for each of those different slices. Uh, and you might have also some shared elements uh, across different slices, and you see some examples here of uh, two elements that uh, will likely be shared. Uh, could also be dedicated, but very likely will be shared. So with that, what happens is that now we need to create this IP network in the middle between uh, all of the radios and the core, and that network needs to be aware of slicing because maybe at, at the end of the day, slicing uh, is just a different way of talking about SLAs. So you might have some slice in the core that is a low latency slice. And then for that, you need to transport that slice to the closest core element uh, using the lowest latency links. Um, or you might have a high bandwidth uh, slice and you need lots and lots of bandwidth. It's maybe a fixed wireless type of deployment for residential broadband. So you need to bring that on a very fat pipe uh, to a very large uh, user plane function in the network. And what that brings us at the end of the day as IP engineers is constraint-based routing, right? So it's no different than that. So um, you say, I want low latency, I want high bandwidth, I want a combination of these and, and many other parameters that we might think about. And when you translate that into IP-like technologies, it's really traffic engineering. So. Um, the, the best way to address um, network slicing from a transport perspective is really to have a traffic engineering enabled uh, IP network, and then you pick and choose your own favorite uh, traffic engineering tools, right? You can use, uh, you know, uh, centralized uh, uh, PCEs. You can use um, maybe uh, segment routing with uh, IPv6, segment routing with MPLS. 
uh, and so on and so forth. So just pick and choose whatever makes sense. There's obviously pros and cons between them. I'm not going to go through uh, that uh, because it's out outside of the scope now. Uh, all right, so talking a little bit more about the radio. And this is a picture from a 4G network. So the main care about of any mobile network is densification. So that essentially means that uh, maybe in an environment like this, densification means that I want to be able to push the largest amount of uh, bits in this environment. So um, in, in spectrum terms, it's uh, the most bits per hertz. Or it, you, you can deploy lots and lots of radios or you can get more efficient modulation. Uh, because the modulation is standard, you cannot change your modulation, right? Because it, it needs to be standard in all of the uh, cell phones and the radios. You essentially start putting more radios into the same location to get more density. That's how we, well, everybody typically does it. Um, but once you start doing that, you need to make sure that these radios talk between them and coordinate uh, so that they don't actually generate interference, but actually work together in, in a way that uh, capacity is augmented. Um, so to do that, um, there was a different type of architecture in a 4G network, which is, uh, which is called CRAN or centralized RAN. And then uh, the basic idea is that you centralize a little bit of that intelligence and that you start connecting all of these antennas back to this uh, centralized uh, unit, which, uh, you know, the antennas are called the RH, the remote radio hats, which are essentially RF units. And then all of the intelligence is in the base baseband processing unit. It's called BBU. So with that, you can deploy lots of radios in a single location and get coordinated, um, co coordinated uh, efforts between all of them. Uh, you immediately can link that to a uh, wireless LAN controller type of deployment with, with Wi-Fi. So very similar type of thinking here. Um, and then uh, there's, there's the need for a protocol to do that between the BBU and the RRH. And that protocol is called CIPRI, uh, Common uh, Public Radio uh, Interface. So CIPRI, what it actually does is it's a TDM-based uh, technology. Uh, typically runs over fiber. And um, it, it carries digital radio samples. So you're, we're getting the raw samples from the RF layer encapsulating them in, in TDM and sending them across the CIPRI link. And um, there's not only the, the radio, the, the data itself, there's also control and, and management, but there's also synchronization. So synchronization is very key on any mobile network because if you move from one radio to the other, the other radio needs to uh, take over and carry on processing uh, your cell phone connection from where it stopped in the last radio. So you need synchronization between all of these radios in a very simple way. Uh, that, that's uh, how you do or why you do it. So because here we're getting digital radio samples, the bandwidth associated with CIPRI does not depend on the number of uh, UEs or the number of cell phones attached to a single radio. So if there's zero people using the network, or if there's a thousand people using the network, the bandwidth is going to be always the same because we're getting digital raw samples, right? So it's, it doesn't vary with usage. Uh, and the other characteristic is that because it carries synchronization in a raw way, in, in a raw format, uh, we have a very little admittance to jitter. So we need to take care of this connection in a way that we don't vary the jitter a lot, and there's strict latency requirements as well. All of this uh, come brings us to the conclusion that we need a fiber uh, connection there. And, and many times you use uh, WDM, sometimes you use dark fiber for that. Now, what is different in 5G from a radio perspective? And again, we need to understand the radio because we're building a network for it. Uh, one of the things that uh, is, is more relevant in, uh, in 5G is the ability to have larger radio channels. So in 4G, it's, you typically get either a 5 plus 5, 10 plus 10, or 20 plus 20 megahertz channels. So that means maybe you have 40 megahertz, uh, 20 uplink, uh, 20 downlink, so total 40, uh, 40 um, megahertz for, for uh, putting your bits into a given space in the air. Um, 5G aims to have 400 megahertz and even upwards of that, maybe 800 megahertz channels. 
uh, which is 10 to 20 times the capacity that we have uh, in terms of spectrum in 4G. Now, there's a problem because that spectrum is not widely available in all bands. So the only way you can get all of that bandwidth is by using some areas in the spectrum that are not used today, which is typically above 24 gigahertz, uh, and that's called millimeter wave. So whenever you talk about 5G, you, you, you're going to hear about um, uh, millimeter wave, and that's where you really get all of that bandwidth from, from 5G. So uh, you, you can definitely deploy 5G in lower bands as well, and there's going to be um, um, deployments. So reportedly, um, for example, T-Mobile in the US is going to deploy 5G in 600 megahertz. And uh, that is very good for coverage, right? So the lower the frequency, the, the, the bigger the coverage area. Uh, but that's not very good for capacity because you have very little bandwidth in, in those areas. So you're really going to see those promised bandwidths when you start deploying in the millimeter wave uh, area. And the other innovation from a 5G perspective is that it starts to use MIMO, so multiple input, multiple output. And um, trying to make a rough comparison with a, an IP technology, you can think about this as maybe a multicast uh, type of um, uh, implementation where you send that signal multiple times, but in a different way, such that if these signals will reflect differently in different, uh, in different obstacles, uh, the UE is going to receive those different signals in different uh, phase um, uh, sets. And um, the UE can actually, through multiple antennas, recombine those signals and with that enhance the signal to noise ratio. So it's kind of very technical, but in a way you're sending the bits many times and the receiver will get those bits and recombine them to enhance the signal and to get higher speeds, essentially. So um, when we look at these technologies and the impact that we have in that, uh, in that setup that we had in the centralized RAN, uh, because that centralized RAN is using raw digital, uh, digital samples from the radio, uh, we get a, a pretty constant bit rate coming from each antenna, and, and that only depends on the radio spectrum uh, on the band that we have for that radio. For roughly every antenna on a 20 megahertz channel, we get a rough, around one gigabits per second of bandwidth. That's kind of a rough, a rough approximation. Uh, if we start scaling that up, maybe putting four antennas um, with still 20 megahertz channel, we go up to four gigs. Uh, if we go up to 64 antennas, and there's already 64 antennas being deployed in LTE, and there's certainly going to be that number of antennas in, deployed in, in 5G, we go all the way up to 64 gigs. And if we widen the uh, channel to 100 megahertz, not even 400, we are in the um, neighborhoods of 300 gigabits per second. So there's just no way that we can reuse that same technology that was uh, created for 4G uh, where we have that front hall link uh, writing the CIPRI protocol, uh, there's no, just no way we're going to be able to use that for 5G. So to tackle that problem, there were many uh, initiatives across the industry, many different standards bodies. Uh, obviously, 3GPP as the main standards body for, um, for 5G started uh, analyzing how to tackle that problem. IEEE had a key uh, contribution here. There are uh, two main initiatives. One of them is uh, 802.1cm, uh, or most widely known as TSN, time sensitive networks. Um, and the other is uh, the next generation front hall interface and GFI. So there's two initiatives there 1914.1, 1914.3. So 1914.1 is uh, essentially how you uh, outlining the requirements for a packet front hall, packet based front hall, and 1914.3 uh, is. Um, it's it, it's a, an encapsulation technology where you get the typical CIPRI and encapsulate that in packets. Uh, there's also some work on CIPRI, and uh, there was the uh, release of uh, eCIPRI, so I'll, I'll go through that in a few slides. And uh, MAF is also talking about how to deal with that um, uh, from a services perspective. So uh, let's start looking at, into that. So. Uh, in order for us to understand how this was solved, uh, it's important that we go a little bit deeper on the radio and look at the protocol stack of a radio, of a mobile radio interface. So this is the protocol stack of, uh, of uh, uh, any radio in 4G, and it is the same for 5G. Uh, 
Um, you have all of these, these different layers, but at the end of the day, you have layer one, layer two, layer three, just like any other network we all use every day. Uh, it's just different protocols. So you see lots of options here uh, on the right, and these options uh, are associated with the options that uh, TreeGPP evaluated where to make that split. And uh, the split uh, is relevant here because as you move from the bottom, which is the antenna, the RF, uh, up, uh, you have a, a less and less bandwidth. Or if you think about on, on the other hand, you get an IP packet in the top, and once you go over different layers, you add encapsulations, and you add redundancy, and you add CRC, and you add retransmissions and things like that, just for delivery, for uh, making sure that all of the bits arrive where you want them to arrive. So the bandwidth in the RF layer is higher than the bandwidth requirements in the IP layer. So very simple, um, very simple way of thinking about this, right? Uh, and the other um, care about here is latency. So we don't have a, a minimum latency for IP, right? So we, we, IP can work in pretty much you know, any type of latency, even seconds. Uh, but as we move inside the radio, you see the PDCP and so on and so forth, all of these layers, you're dealing with intra-radio uh, protocols and encapsulations. And because of that, there's retransmission timers and things like that, and, and modulation, uh, and, and, and all of those things related to the radio protocols, that as we get closer to the RF, the latency requirements are more strict. So in other words, if we're looking at the RF layer, the latency requirements are very strict because we're looking at raw samples, digital samples. And as we move up, that latency requirement gets more relaxed. So the 4G split, as we looked before, uh, where we have the front hall link uh, between the RH and the BBU, that split gets done between the RF and the PHY technology. Um, so we basically cut the radio there, put a fiber, between the PHY layer and the RF layer, and there you go. Uh, and the protocol that runs between them is CIPRI. So that's how we did for, for 4G. Now, we're looking on the right here that we're probably in the worst place in terms of bandwidth, because we have the higher bandwidth requirements, and the worst place in terms of uh, latency, because we have the lowest latency requirements here. Uh, so the way it's sold for 4G, it's a little bit different. So there's a different approach in 5G where instead of having only one split or one, only one break between layers, we have actually two. Uh, so we have a lower layer split, sometimes also referred as real-time split, where instead of using uh, the split between the phi and the RF, we break the phi layer in the middle. So uh, essentially what we're doing is getting a little bit of the phi processing and putting that uh, further down to the antenna elements. Uh, and then we have a high layer split, which is also referred to as a non-real time split. And why do we have a high layer split? Well, we have another high layer split because the functions that are above the, that split are not real time. And because they're not real time, we can virtualize those functions, right? So we can essentially not use them in, in uh, uh, specific chipsets anymore, but we can start to use them in standard x86 compute nodes. So you start bringing kind of a cloud uh, perspective to, to the radio, and that's why sometimes the 5G radio architecture is uh, denominated as cloud RAN, because a part of the radio implementation can be implemented in servers. And then obviously there's open protocols between all of them uh, to, to make sure we have interoperability and things like that, right? So when we take that, we now look at a 5G radio, not as one single component anymore, but rather three different components. So we now have the RU, or radio unit, or remote unit, uh, depends on who you talk to. Uh, that's, again, the RF layer, but with a little bit more intelligence, with a little bit more electronics, because we have the PHY processing there. And the reason we have the PHY processing there is because of MIMO. So because we need to replicate that, uh, that signal across many different antennas, we do that replication in the remote unit or the radio unit so that we don't suffer with the bandwidth in the link between the RU and the DU, which is the distributed unit. 
right? So we can send information only once and replicate that into the RU. Now, uh, the DU uh, connects the RU to the centralized unit, to the CU. And uh, the DU performs all of the real-time functions. And as I mentioned, the CU will perform all of the non-real-time functions. And because of that, it shows as a cloud element. Now, a single CU will connect many DUs, and a DU could potentially connect a, a, a few RUs as well. So there you have kind of a, a different setup in which a single radio from a logical perspective can cover a wider range or a wider area uh, when compared to the typical architecture that we had with a fully distributed radio, right? Now, uh, just going back here, sorry, um, it's important to mention that we always had that network segment called backhaul. So the backhaul, as I mentioned right in the beginning, is the segment that connects the CU and the core. And you see the core represented by a single uh, icon here in, in, in the slides. Uh, we already talked about the front hall network, which was initially used with a SIPRI protocol in a 4G world. So front hall can be there as well. Uh, there's a new uh, area in the network which is called mid hall. And mid hall, in this case, will connect the DU to the CU. So let's take a look at all of these three different areas in the network and what are their requirements. So starting with the mid hall, which is the new interface. So the mid hall, uh, and, and this is a representation of mid hall where you have the CU split into control and user plane. You don't have to do that. You can deploy them as a single unit or you could uh, potentially split them. Uh, there's two different types of flows that you have in the mid hall, control and user plane. So for the user plane, it's very, very similar to, um, to, to backhaul. It's essentially uh, IP, UDP, and GTPU. The biggest difference is that instead of having the user's IP packets riding on top of GTP, because this is an intra-radio link, um, we have a, a, different type of, uh, a different type of frame riding on top of GTP, right? an encapsulated frame. Uh, with um, uh, between RLC and PDCP, and for the um, for the control plane, it's also very similar to backhaul. It's IP, SCTP, and then the specific control plane protocol. In this case, F1 AP. So F1 is the uh, that's the name that uh, um, 3GPP gives to 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 the uh, to the protocol running there. And in case you have the separation between control and user plane, also in the in the CU, uh, you have um, the E1 protocol, which is pretty similar to F1, and again, IP and SCTP. So at the end of the day, the mid-haul uh, requirements from a transport and protocol perspective are not very different from backhaul, which is essentially an IP network as we know it, right? Use your own protocols, use your own MPLS or not, so you build just an IP network. Now, there's one thing that is different, because this is an intra-radio link. Um, and we're not exposing IP packets here, we have some specific latency requirements. And I'll talk about latencies uh, in, in, uh, in a subsequent slide here. <coughs> so what about the front hall? So for front hall, instead of CIPRI in a five, uh, that we had in a 4G world, in a 5G world, we're moving away from that TDM-based uh, interface to a packet-based interface which is called eCIPRI, so Ethernet CIPRI. So eCIPRI is an evolution of the CIPRI protocol designed specifically for transporting uh, front hall links over packet. So it rides over uh, good old Ethernet, so you see the uh, either type there. Uh, you could use VLAN, you could use uh, 802.1p, uh, you could use MACSAC if you want, uh, you could use Ethernet OEM, so it's just Ethernet as we know it. Uh, there is a optional layer of encapsulation for IP uh, and UDP, and it's typically easier for everybody to do peering based on IP addresses than it is on MAC addresses. So many of the implementations uh, use IP just for easy of, uh, you know, administration. Um, and you have the eCPRI protocol header on top of that. So the eCPRI protocol will carry, all, obviously, all of the user data. Uh, we'll carry control plane as well uh, and some other services like, for example, if you need to uh, send commands to reset a radio remotely and things like that, it's all uh, covered here. Um, 
So one thing is very different, apart from the fact that we are not using TDM and rather Ethernet, there's one fundamental difference between eCIPRI and CIPRI, and that is synchronization. So CIPRI, as I mentioned, runs uh, with embedded synchronization in its frames, and eCIPRI does not carry synchronization, which means that the underlying Ethernet or IP network that is carrying eCIPRI must provide that synchronization between the nodes that are running that. So, and you see here that synchronization will use any of the well-known protocols for synchronization in packet uh, IP networks, so Sinky or uh, P PTP 1588. Um, and, and, and there's going to be some specific requirements on how we do that. I, I'll have a slide by the end to show that in more detail. So again, eCPRI is just a new protocol that we encapsulate um, all of these bits into packets. And we're not, because, because the RU now has a, the file layer, uh, we're not sending those raw digital samples anymore. And because of that, the bandwidth in the eCPRI layer now varies with the usage, which is another uh, very important characteristic that we want to get because then we can do stat mux, right? So we can essentially use, uh, start using stat mux as we do in any other type of uh, packet-based uh, network. So um, wh what are the gains? Uh, if we get for the same, and, and I won't go, go through this, this is in the eCPRI standard. If anybody's interested, I can talk about that uh, offline, but uh, we essentially get a, a 10 to one uh, savings compared uh, when we compare CIPRI to eCIPRI. So meaning that uh, for a given uh, case study here with uh, all of these assumptions, uh, where we would have uh, about 230 gigs if we use CIPRI, we'll get about 20 or 20 to 30 gigs uh, with a CIPRI, just because we're using a different radio split, right, with, with a different protocol. Now, 20 to 30 is bigger than 10. So whenever we're going into very high bandwidth uh, 5G uh, spectrum, uh, 25 gig E's uh, are gonna be required for all of these uh, connections in front hall. And 25 gig E's is not something that uh, everybody has in their network today. So we typically have one or 10 or maybe 100, but not 25. So this is something that every operator is looking at uh, for front hall, how, how to deal with that. Uh, now in terms of latency, so because now we are splitting the radio into different, uh, into different components, we have very specific latency requirements between all of them. So between the DU and the RU, we have a one-way latency of 100 microseconds. Uh, if you consider that the light in, in a fiber travels in the speed of about five microseconds per kilometer, uh, that gives us roughly 20 kilometers between any DU and an RU. So that in itself is another requirement that directly impacts the way we plan and deploy these networks. So the distance between nodes is very relevant here because we have very strict latency requirements. And obviously, if you put some routers in between uh, and each router, say, takes uh, five uh, microseconds, you just lost two kilometers, right? So. Uh, that is something that it also has to be taken into account when planning these networks. For the mid hall, it's a little bit more relaxed. It's a one millisecond. So uh, again, uh, if we get the same math, we get to 200 kilometers between any CU and any, any given DU. Uh, so it's a little bit more relaxed. You can have some more IP hops in the, in the middle and the microsecond range. And then for back hall, there's not really a um, uh, there's not really a, a limit. You can go upwards of 10 milliseconds or, or maybe less. Now, in the very first slide, I said, well, if 5G is going to give you one millisecond service, how is that possible? Right? So there's limits in physics. So light only travels in a given speed. So it's very important that when we think about giving one millisecond uh, latency type of services, we need to take into account the positioning of where this content or where that content is going to be available for the users. And you see a UPF here uh, uh, just beside the, the CU. So the only way to give one millisecond latency is to put that user plane function right together with the CU, with the radio, 
and serve the content right off that UPF, right? And, and this can be kind of uh, in a 200 uh, kilometer uh, radius, maybe. Uh, now, will every operator from day one deploy these in a, a very distributed way? Probably not, and very likely not. Uh, is it possible now that you get some locations, specific locations with uh, distributed uh, forwarding functions and local content? Yes, technology permits that, but again, it's a matter of business case. So what is the business case to deploy the networks in that way, right? So um, that's how you actually get to the one millisecond latency. Um, so uh, very briefly, 802.1cm, when we talk about front hall, uh, there's one new technology that was introduced, which was frame preemption. So frame preemption is the ability when you're doing QoS to stop transmitting one frame right in the middle of that frame, put another high priority frame on the wire, and then resume transmitting the frame that you had before. As you can imagine, this is not, a, this is not something that we ever did in, um, in Ethernet, so it requires a new Mac chipset to implement that. Uh, and thus, it requires a mated type of um, uh, equipment, right? So both equipments in the link need to, to support that. And that is only required for 10 gigs and below, because with uh, higher speeds, uh, you get actually um, uh, a much faster interframe uh, transmission time, so uh, you don't get a lot of jitter from just doing strict priority. So in most of the, the cases where you have only um, higher speed links, you might not use uh, frame preemption. If you have lower speed links, and, and again, lower speed in this context is uh, below 10 gig, you might need to use frame preemption. Um, and finally, uh, the EC pre-synchronization. So as I mentioned, the EC pre-synchronization uh, has specific requirements depending on the radio again. And you see a table in the middle of the slide and the bottom. Uh, uh, some of the requirements in terms of uh, time error. So time error is essentially uh, the error in, in, in accuracy that you accumulate on your signal as you travel uh, across the network. And uh, if you're just base doing basic uh, TDD, and 5G uses time division duplex, um, initially at least, so time division duplex means that we need time synchronization and time synchronization means that we cannot use synchronous Ethernet alone. So synchronous Ethernet only um, gives us frequency synchronization. That is good for FDD type radio, so frequency division duplex. For TDD, we need uh, 1588, which gives us time and phase. So um, in that case, if you're just doing basic TDD radio with no advanced features, um, you, you're good with uh, 1.1 uh, uh, microseconds uh, from the time source, from the grandmaster, all the way to the RUs. Now, when you start doing uh, inter-RU signaling, so if a given UE will connect to two different radios at the same time, uh, being that for carrier aggregation or MIMO, transmit diversity, or any advanced feature in the radio, you start getting a lot more strict. So uh, you have some numbers there. And, and the right side, you have a relaxed budget type of deployment where you're going to have a grandmaster, many boundary clocks in between, uh, and uh, all of the uh, slave clocks and the RUs. Uh, or in the left, you have more tight budget. And in this case, you're probably going to want to deploy a GPS with uh, the DU, and the D DU becomes the grandmaster for 1588 for the RUs, and then uh, the RUs are still the, the slave so that you minimize the time error. And how many hops you can have in between? Well, it depends on the type of router that you have. So you have another table on the left, in the bottom left of the router classes. So each router has a specific signature in terms of delivering um, uh, time error, constant time error. So the better your router, the more hops you can traverse. Now to finalize, uh, I know it's a lot of information, but I just wanted to, to leave this last slide with um, with, with a conclusion. So you see here different types of deployments. And those different types of deployments are essentially because there's multiple bands, multiple spectrum bands for 5G uh, to be deployed. So there's low bands like 600 megahertz, uh, one gig, and so on and so forth. There's mid band, which is uh, 2.5, 3.5 probably is gonna be a big one. Uh, and there's high band, which is millimeter wave. 
So depending on the band, on the spectrum band that you get, you're probably going to get a uh, different type of uh, deployment uh, scenario in terms of the radio. So uh, for example, in the lower one, where you have a combined CU, DU, and RU, that's probably going to be the case for low band, because you, you don't have a lot of capacity. So it makes sense uh, to have all of that combined, because you don't need coordination between radios. The cell size is so big that you don't need to, you, you, you don't require any type of coordination. So you will have, in that case, only backhaul. You might have some small cells, for example, where you combine the CU and the DU uh, in a centralized location, and you have only the RU. And in that case, you only use front hall for these bands. Uh, maybe you have a microsite with um, millimeter wave, and because there's so much bandwidth in millimeter wave, you don't want to have front hall because bandwidth is going to be exploding. So you actually combine the DU and the RU, and you only have mid hall. Or you can go and deploy a completely decomposed radio, which is in the top. At the end of the day, any operator will probably have all of these in a network, and it's a function of the radio planning and the IP team to get together and come to a design that can uh, accommodate all of these use cases rather than one or the other. So at the end of the day, the main message here is that no one size fits all, uh, and it's something that needs to be done hand in hand between the radio and the IP teams. And with that, I finish here. I'm not sure if there's time for questions. Hola. Ahí está. Gracias, Igor. Tenemos tiempo para dos preguntas. Eh, les pedimos que se acerquen al micrófono y se presenten. And again, feel free to speak Portuguese or Spanish if, if you want. Uh, hola, Igor. Eu vou falar en portugués. Parabéns pela apresentação, muito boa. É, é uma, uma pergunta que é, tem a ver com, com, com o endereçamento IP. Quando da rede 4G é, havia uma preocupação com a quantidade de endereços, e falou-se muito que seria IPv6, based, a, a, o, o backhaul, midhaul, tudo com IPv6. Conversando com o fabricante, ele falou, olha, é opcional, o 3GPP colocou IPv6, mas é opcional. Muitas das redes utilizarem IPv4, se não, enganado, se não estou enganado, não conheço muito dessa área. Em relação a, 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 a 5G, como é que está isso é, na parte de endereçamento dentro do core, do backhaul, midhaul? Ok. Bom, é, eu vou responder em português também. É, tem tem duas, duas perspectivas que a gente tem que olhar. Uma é o que os celulares, o que os usuários vão receber... E a outra é como a rede vai transportar isso é, dentro da, da rede privada da operadora. Né? Como eu mencionei anteriormente, a gente tem, ah, a gente tem um encapsulamento né, dos, dos frames do usuário a, acontecendo ali dentro da rede do operador. É, com relação aos, aos usuários, com certeza a gente vai ter IPv6 e, e potencialmente IPv4 também. Ah, acho que ainda por um tempo. Então, acho que isso é, é, é fato consumado, a gente não tem que se preocupar. Com relação a, a, ao transporte interno da operadora, uh, muitas das operadoras a, ainda estão começando com IPv4. Por quê? Porque simplesmente é uma... A gente, nenhuma operadora vai criar uma rede completamente nova. Muitas das operadoras vão ter que adicionar 5G a uma rede existente. Então, não é uma rede overlay. As operadoras não estão criando uma nova rede só para transportar 5G. Num site que tem 2G, 3G, 4G, elas vão adicionar 5G. Então, inicialmente, o 5G... Eu acho que potencialmente vai também passar sobre IPv4. Algumas operadoras já usam IPv6, mas posso dizer com certeza que 100% das operadoras estão olhando como eliminar o IPv4 também dessa rede interna, porque não faz mais sentido e, e principalmente com o potencial de crescimento de 5G, trazendo é, esse core da rede mais próximo ao usuário, isso vai se tornar ainda pior. Tá? Então, essa, acho que todo mundo está olhando para IPv6. Olá, Douglas, Douglas Fischer do Brasil. É, acho que uma das principais mudanças que se comenta muito no ambiente da, do 5G é a mudança no, na característica construtiva da rede, como ela é, como são colocadas as antenas de, à disposição, como cada cada antena é abordada. É, isso traz, você comentou a respeito da, da múltipla recepção distribuída em rádios diferentes de um cliente que está no meio de duas antenas e como isso é reconstruído num ponto central. É, isso, isso me traz uma, uma preocupação. 
é, a, a múltipla existência, a existência de múltiplos, múltiplas operadoras, cada uma com su, seus, seus conjuntos de antenas, e outros, ou, outras concorrendo em sinal e espectro, isso, na, a meu ver, interpretando, traria uma dificuldade, uma saturação de espectro. Faria sentido falar que no 5G... A, o, compartilha, o compartilhamento de infraestruturas, o que seria hoje as MVNOs, ou seja, uma, uma infraestrutura única para todo mundo, uh, sendo múltiplas transmissões acontecendo na, 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 na mesma infraestrutura, faz mais sentido? Existe algum movimento nesse, nessa linha? Ok. É, bom, a, as redes celulares, elas trabalham em, é, em espectro privado. Então, o que, que isso significa? Que uma operadora, ela vai na, no órgão regulamentador do, do país e ela compra o direito de somente ela usar aquele determinado espectro. É, é diferente, por exemplo, do Wi-Fi, onde qualquer access point uh, usa o mesmo espectro e eles concorrem entre si. Então, porque a operadora comprou, ela não tem interferência de ninguém mais. Então, isso é garantido pela, pela propriedade daquele espectro. É, agora, existe uma grande discussão é, em torno de usar espectro compartilhado também. Então, o espectro compartilhado serviria para é, é, aumentar, aumenta, é, para sumir a palavra, para melhorar ou para complementar, perdão, é complementar a banda que você tem no uh, que você tem no, no espectro privado. Então, quando a gente vai para aquele espectro compartilhado, aí sim existem maneiras de você utilizar aquele espectro compartilhado entre múltiplas operadoras. Além de tudo isso, obviamente que implementar uma rede é, celular é muito caro, principalmente em países grandes, né, como o Brasil, ou, ou até países que têm uma geografia é, é, complexa, como a gente vê na América Latina, onde você tem montanhas e você não tem acesso à fibra e coisas assim. Então, é, eu diria que o compartilhamento de infraestrutura e de torres hoje vem muito mais do ponto de vista de custo, de economia de custo, onde você tem um site onde a, a energia, o espaço e, e etc. é compartilhado, do que necessariamente com a utilização do espectro. É, agora temos uma pergunta do colega que nos assiste online, Danton Nunes. Ele pergunta sobre a utilização de microcélulas em 5G em ambientes urbanos mais densos. Como que isso é, é, é encarado dentro do ambiente do... Sim, é, isso, isso é, uma, é algo que todas as operadoras estão olhando, é, como trazer mais capacidade em, em sites urbanos densos. É, muito provavelmente, é, es, essas microcélulas elas, elas vão operar na área de millimeter wave, né, na, nas frequências mais altas, porque obviamente ela tem uma propagação muito menor, então é mais fácil de você implementar microcélulas com, nessa faixa de frequência. É, agora, isso, como eu disse, é, depende, como as operadoras usam espectro privado, depende de que cada governo, de cada país, disponibilize espectro nessa faixa de frequência, para que as operadoras possam comprar esses espectros, essas faixas de espectro, e depois implementar é, as, as microcélulas. Então, tem um aspecto regulatório que vai vir antes do aspecto técnico de implementação da tecnologia. Bom, bueno, muito obrigado, Igor. Gracias, obrigado. Bueno, comenzamos ahora con el...